Today's Enter Live is about a very exciting subject, the subject of water beetle recording, which has a very long history, which I'm sure Garth is going to go into. So um, I won't I won't spoil any surprises. And I'm going to hand over to Garth Foster of the Balfour Brown Club and the Aquatic Coleoptera Conservation Trust. So over to you, Garth. OK, thanks very much. I, uh, um, I did look at what I said I was going to do last year. And it, this approximates it. It's, it's not the same. Um, I do represent, in a sense, two organisations. The uh, the Belfort Brown Club goes back to 1970s, and it's okay. It's become a sort of international st uh, study group where we, we have meetings, if we can, COVID permitting, uh, abroad and so on. Uh, whereas the Aquatic Coleoptera Conservation Trust, which is very cleverly means act if you look at it properly, um, is just there to get any money in the unlikely event anybody gives us any money, which they don't, of course, because we're water beetles and we don't expect it. All right, the um. I'm going to acknowledge the, the, the people I've, I've used to start with. I reckon about three and three and a half to 4,000 recorders at, at the moment. Uh, not not right now, but over a period of time. Um, I've borrowed or stolen photographs from the other BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, with the Balfour Brown Club, BBC. Uh, I also got some from Butterfly Conservation from Jason Doe in the Environment Agency, Manfred Yak in the Vienna Museum, Kev Jones in APEM. Uh, and and there's people on the, on their own account, Jeff Nobes, Ivan Lang, and oh, Ivan Lang's at ISPB, and Dennis Denise Orland and, and Wikiwand as well. I also uh, nicked a, a map from GBIF, and of course Kieran here is the one who organised it. He takes the blame for all this. All right. Um, as far as what, what's what's water, notice for start that water is in quotes. Um, I reckon I work look after if one can do such a thing. Our 344 species. Although in fact they look after me, uh, the there are about two thirds of them live in basically ponds and anything wet them with a bit of vegetation. So 235 species are associated with that. So it's the major vast majority. Um, less than 10 percent though in running water. There are a few species, a handful of species that can do both, living in stagnant water and in still water. Uh, and then there's uh, one in 20 is more or less confined to salt water. Uh, on uh, in, in lagoons, even in rock pools. Uh, five species live in deeply shaded habitats, not bothered about what plants are, are shadowing them, as long as they're shaded, they've got plenty of dead leaf litter. Uh, six species are, I put down their subterranean, but the, the correct expression really ought to be something like um, semi-subterranean, because they're, they're sort of in the twilight zone, a bit like me, uh, and they, uh, we don't have any. We do get a species goes more than a mile down in Derbyshire, but it still comes up to the surface now and again. And then, just to be awkward, uh, and that's the reason for the quotes for water. A lot of those species aren't, aren't water beetles at all. Uh, we we look after uh, a, a number of species that are closely related to water beetles, and nobody else will touch them as part of their own schemes. I, I tried, for example, to get rid of our, our dung in, dung beetles onto the dung beetle recording scheme, and they wouldn't have anything of it. So we, we look after 19 species that live in dung. And if you think about it, cattle dung is a bit like swimming through a fairly thick uh, pond anyway. Yeah, this is the, you said, uh, I was going to talk about history. Can you all, I hope you can all see that slide. Mine's got so much clutter around it that it's difficult to show you. But uh, to the top left, we have the magnificent um, Strang pastel of David Sharp. It's, you can see it in Cambridge University Museum. And uh, he, he, he met up in the 20th of August, 1904, when he was quite an old man, he was then curator of the, uh, of the museum in, in Cambridge University. He met up with an up and coming young man, Frank Balfour Brown, uh, uh, to slake their thirst at the village pump in Burwell, which is just off one of the old uh, Cambridgeshire fens, where they'd both been collecting beetles in the morning. And he, he, they presumably had a conversation which ran along the lines of, uh, would it be a good idea, sir, if I was to run a recording scheme and uh, David Sharp, who didn't very rarely generate any useful records at all, said, yeah, that's a great idea. Get on with it. And so ever since then, Balfour Brown basically uh, thought about running or it did actually run a recording scheme. So there we are. And there's there's no blue plaque on that, that pump. It's got a label on it, which is quite good. And it's obviously not functional anymore. But I think it really ought to be a plaque to commemorate the, the rebirth of the third recording scheme in Britain. 
uh, following on plants and snails. We were the first invertebrate recording scheme. We're still going after a fashion now. Uh, a word about Balfour Brown. Uh, he was he wasn't actually Scots, but he was born in London, but he, he was reared in Dumfries. Uh, he came from a very well-heeled family, and uh, they forced him to go to the bar. In other words, to take law, as was normal in this situation, he went to the bar. He went to the bar, never, never actually served as a barrister or winner or solicitor or anything like that. Uh, but he, he certainly adopted the measured the methods of uh, law. Uh, when he, he tackled anybody, he, he didn't want he didn't he, uh, he didn't want to have an argument with him. He'd always win. Um, but he, eventually, what got his way in in the fact he wanted to become a biologist. And he, he started studying uh, bony fish eggs at Plymouth Marine um, Field Station or Field Station in 1900. And eventually got a job. He, he met up with the Gurneys, who were a famous banking firm of, the, of that time. And the Gurneys had run one of the first uh, field field centres uh, in Norfolk Broads. And he was their first member of the staff, as far as I can understand it. Uh, you, you can still see the little building there with the pictures of what went on inside. He started working with it for them in 1903 on dragonflies. He stuck it for about a year and a half, and then he realised that, that dragonflies weren't worth a light because there just weren't enough species. He became much more interested in water beetles, and for the rest of his life, from 1904 onwards, that's all he ever did. And I can't say I blame him. The, if you're talking about atlases, um, here are the atlases that the Bibles, or the Bible of, of our club, uh, the, the three v volumes of his particular book, uh, in the 1940s and 50s. Classic work, obviously out of date now, but still very interesting reading. And he, he didn't, uh, he he, uh, he got stuck into people if he didn't like them. So you know his views quite strongly, un unlike us, of course, where we're very much more polite. Uh, and here are atlases. Uh, there are three of them. Uh, you've seen already uh, Kieran advertising at £25 and £24, the, the Royal Ensoc keys. Um, I've been nice. I don't think I get any royalties anymore. Not that we've got very much in the royalties anyway. Um, but you certainly don't get royalties from the atlases. And there's uh, the first one is on named diving beetles with a squeak beetle on the front. Second one was uh, on mud beetles or hydrophilid beetles uh, with a monocus on the front. And the third one, I'm particularly proud of this slide because we, we, we nabbed it from a, a video clip a German video clip of a dry ops under the water, absolutely covered in, in, in a bubble. And the reason I did this was to, just to be awkward, just to show that rather than the sort of standard pictures you see of beetles with their, with their legs sticking out and their antennae beautifully set and so on, they, these were to show the differences in breathing systems. All of them use air. Obviously, the squeak beetle has a bubble of air attached to a, a bigger bubble underneath its wing cases. The hydrophil is in the middle have uh, bubbles underneath their wing cases, but also extending, as you can see in the one on the left in the middle of the middle shot, they also, it also covers a sort of silvery covering to the underside of the body. And then in dry ups, it goes even further. And virtually everything in, on their body is covered in a, a plastron of uh, bubbles, uh, and apart from their little little sort of socks, sock-like legs hanging onto the stick there. So I, I thought these were rather good shots to show the difference in these three things and what they do. I say there, there are those two handbooks that were mentioned, uh, as a, an absolute pinch at, cinch at uh, 24 quid. And then you can also, I think I'm quite mostly proud of anything at all. It's a, of the, we produced the first ever um, inter, international red list because we covered both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland under one cover. And that was eventually followed by the red list for the Great Britain as opposed to UK. So, so the the UK, Northern Ireland is part of the first publication. So we have produced red lists, all of which are totally out of date. But there you are. And here is the Balfour Brown Club. I have the, I love this slide, and it's, it's very dated now, but it, it shows you where we are. First of all, it shows you what was originally called a GB net, which is now sold by EFE. Oh, no, 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 it's now sold by NHPS under the name EFE. But it's the same net anyway. Uh, so that's the standard net. You might see somebody there. Uh, is actually carrying the most important piece of equipment as far as I'm concerned, which is the tray. And I, I, if, if there was a copyright for the tray, then I would claim it. The person holding it is a one of our most revered entomologists, Ignacio Ribeiro, unfortunately swept away in Barcelona by COVID, one of the first victims. Uh, and But most of these people you see are British, as you might expect. But then there's also Dutch, 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 um, where are we? French, Dutch, German, uh, Dutch and so on. You get the impression we have quite, neat, quite a reasonably international group. Uh, the, if you look more carefully, 
This is Catfield Fen. And if you look into that, just underneath that, that bush there, you'll find Agabus striolatus. It's one of our various uh, water beetles, lives in that uh, part of the swamp. If you look along the edge of this, this main dike in Catfield Fen in Norfolk, uh, you'll find Hydrochus megathallus, which is a species we, that was described within our newsletter um, as a species new to science, but still considered to be highly endangered in, in, the, in Europe. Uh, and if you look here, down here, about just about here, just just off screen about here, uh, that's where I got the last pedestrians in Catfield Fen in 1977. Anyway, well, I, I, that's all standard stuff. Right, that, 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 that you get that in most of my talks, whether you like it or not. And I, I was determined I, I don't like doing the same talk, rehashing the talk, or, or do, doing the same talk again. So I'm trying to do something different this time. It doesn't work. I apologise. If it gets too cluttered, I also apologise, but I didn't want to get involved in too much animation on each slide because that can create problems with Zoom. Uh, so I'm going to look at nine species briefly and try and, at the end of it, try and pick up some ideas based on what I know about these nine species. The first species is Hydrophus scalzianus. We immediately hit the buffers, don't we? It doesn't matter how you pronounce this. Um, most people, some of all those say idiopolis, uh, it's a French. Uh, they, I, I never actually understand how they do it in Dutch. In Scalesianus, I say I say Scalesianus because it's named after Mr. Scales, but most people say Scalesianus, and we have some some people we unfortunately uh, emphasise the anus. But that's another story again. Uh, it's our smallest hydroporous in the diving beetles at two millimeters. You can't really miss it if you know what you're looking for because uh, it's so small and it's so red, or at least it looks red in the most parts of its body. Its wing cases are also red, except they here they look a bit dark. Uh, it lives in wet moss in fens at the edges of ponds and so on. The, the larvae are predators of, of uh, copepods, adults the same. And we have got a common name for it, which is unusual, and we call it Mr. Scales's diving bee. Mr. Scales, he came from Beecham Well in Norfolk. He must have sent some material from that part of Norfolk, West Norfolk, to uh, Mr. Stevens, who then described the species honorably Mr. Scales in 1829-ish. That's a weird distribution of species, so I'll show you in a moment. Uh, basically, it's, well, we'll get down to it. It has an unusually good-looking uh, fossil record, but don't be fooled by this record. I hope you can see this map properly. It's a bit thin on my, my screen here, but basically you can see there, there's its distribution in, in Ireland, uh, common across most of the centre of Ireland, in uh, cut over the bogs, that's um, peat bogs where the peat, peat cuttings have been taken out for fuel, and because the water is limey, because the, the underlying rock is, is karstic, it's limestone, you get sort of lime-rich water flooding these old peat cuttings. So you get a very interesting and unusual and uh, sort of human in, humanly induced uh, pond which is, which beetles absolutely adore so it's very common in most parts of the world where that happens also in this part of the world here there's a, a, a whole series of drumlin things small pockets of water in amongst the uh, glacial deposits and uh, they you know, like them as well but then you look at the distribution in Britain it's absolutely crazy I mean there you've got it's it's in one site in, in Scotland in Angus uh, nearby Belgai's Loch in, in Angus. Uh, it's in one site in Cumberland, on, on, a, on the edge of a river there. Uh, it's in one site in Anglesey. It's in a tiny site on the edge of Morden Bog in Dorset. No else, just there, uh, um, maybe more than, no more than a couple of square metres of water. Uh, it's, in, it's in one tiny little peat bog in County Durham, and it's also in the edge, edge of the you know, Hornsey Mere, or a bog associated with Hornsey Mere. And then there are old records, as you can see, the, the green, the loose, these shiny green dots are old records. They used to be originally found in Ascombe Bog in Yorkshire. And then, of course, you've got the X's, which are the fossils. And you see the, you see the distribution there suggests you a distribution. Well, we'll come on to that later on. It's not really, it's it's more like by luck than judgment, I suspect. But the most interesting part of the fossil deposit is here, where the Maureen Girling did, did all the original work on fossils in the sunset levels. And she reported this is one of the commonest beetles there, uh, so much so that in some cases she could actually see the peats were red because they had so many wing cases in them rather than sphagnum leaves. Uh, so it's a very common species in, in certain situations there. That's all completely extinct now. And uh, well, there's a builder's yard in London, but that's a very old record as well. But as you see, the main, main centre for it in Britain is the Brex, in the Pingo Fens, 
and in the north in the fens are associated not actually in the broads themselves but in the fens associated with the norfolk broads so that, that's one distribution which is if you can explain why they're coastal the temptation is say oh it's all climatic um, but then they're all in relic sites these are very ancient sites on the coast and then it so does so well here why isn't it doing the same for example across the center of uh, britain uh, Vantus sutralis, I'm going to throw it up as another diving beagle, bigger this time, sort of thumbnail size, uh, lives in ponds. It actually is not a, not averse to a spot of pollution. It can live with pollution anyway. Again, predator as adults and larvae will feed them virtually anything. And it's got another name. It's called the Super Tramp. Now, this is why. This this Vantus sutralis, as you can see on the left top left, it can fly, flies vigorously too. Uh, and it occupies an extraordinary range of the world. Uh, Michael Borker in 2009 coined the name for it, Super Tramp, on the basis that he, he worked out it, it was one of the it was one of the many species that uh, evolved in the New Guinea uplands in the highlands uh, during mountain forming, and uh, had taken off from there and became the commonest species of water beetle in New Zealand, in certainly many Pacific islands. Uh, it's very, very common in most of the parts of uh, Australia, gets into Japan, China and so on. And then it's um, scattered across most of Europe. It writes to the Azores. And as you can see, even up into the, the, uh, the tree part of the Arctic in, in, uh, in, in Europe. It's amazing distribution. We don't have anything else quite like that. Hence the name Supertramp. Uh, but if you look at its distribution in Britain, they have a different story. Uh, it's one of our first records of, of, of extant living beetles, as, as opposed to fossil beetles in Britain. And it was recorded by some bloke called Charles Darwin when he was uh, uh, at a university in Cambridge. He found it in a, in a fen north of Cambridgeshire, not, not actually in Wickham Fen, the usual place, but somewhere near Whittlesea. Uh, and he, he, was, 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 he first recorded it, and that's a picture again by Stevens in Stevens' book in the 1820s. Didn't actually get to Scotland, until 1999 and so there's a record in the sense of a, a slow spread across britain you can see that's what in england that's what we might call a sort of lowland distribution it's almost a sort of five pointed star if you can believe that uh it's in in ireland uh there were certainly records of it in the 1920s around dublin and in the north and that died out but now it's starting to spread out over the southeast corner of Ireland so there's been at least two invasions as far as we know um, it gets as far as uh, recently the Scilly Isles uh, again quite recently in some cases the Channel Isles um, Isle of Man certainly recently and as I say got into Scotland in 1999 and spread right the way up to Caithness uh, so an, an example of an active progression okay so that's an obvious extreme difference between that species and the hard droppers Scalesianus, Scalesianus. Next one, totally different again. This is uh, a species I've called here Riolus or Riolus nitens. Uh, you, some of you might know it as something else. Um, it's a riffle beetle. Riffle beetles are almids. Uh, riffle beetles live mainly in fast water, uh, relying on um, oxygenated water from the disturbance of the water going over a riffle in a, in a stream. Uh, again, it's very small, two millimeters long, lives on coarse particulate matter. So it's, it's not a sort of shredder as such. It just takes advantage of the, whatever the shredding insects have already done, so the dead leaves and so on. And it tends to live in not, not necessarily in just fast water running water, but in the fast running water in, in the estuarine or near estuarine parts of deep, big rivers. So it's not in high mountain streams. It's in the much deeper rivers. Um, it's possibly our rarest riffle beetle in Britain. As, as you can see from these green dots here, up here, it used to be um, frequently recorded in the 19th century, that is, in uh, in the north of England. Uh, again, you see that fossil record? It looks similar to Scalesianus. Uh, and again, one of the reasons for this is, in fact, most of the fossil work was done from people uh, living in the Midlands, uh, Birmingham upwards, uh, where a lot of their fossil deposits are uh, from the Midlands. And uh, we think of it as, as amateur water beetles, we tend to think of it as a very rare species confined to one or two sites in the Wye Valley. In fact, um, we've had to change our plans here because Royalist Nitens, uh, the, the Jason Doe in the Environment Agency, has started to recognise 
quite a few larvae from the Environment Agency samples. I mean, it's a charming little larvae. It looks, it's quite friendly, doesn't it? With that little white face and white eyeball. Well, not a black face and white or eyeball, I should say. Very distinctive. And, uh, of course, given the, the proximity to it, its presence in the Y, there's a temptation to suppose it's in, in massive danger because of the all the algal blooms that are coming down from all the... Uh, that all the chicken farmers are in Herefordshire and so on. Um, it remains to be seen this because, uh, in, in fact, Jason Doe is finding it in several other river systems as larvae. But you very rarely actually see the adults. So rare, in fact, are the adults that that isn't even a photograph of one. That, that's Riola subviolaceus, which is the nearest I can get to what the beetle looks like. And in case you're wondering, the BBC, I mentioned the BBC earlier on, British Broadcasting Corporation, this is a slide of theirs of the goddess of the Y, um, which is one of these things here. Somebody's put their hand over their image as if they 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 can't stand the eyes of looking at that. Better move on quickly. Yeah. Oh, it's Rachel. Okay. Uh, right, another small beetle. This one is less than two millimeters long, one point six millimeters long. Uh, it's a hydrinid, Octhebius. Uh, they're called minute moss beetles, which is okay. They're minute, all right. But there, there's certainly very few of them actually live in wet moss. So it's, it's a bit of a misnomer. And this particular species, Octhebius nilsoni, lives on what's become known as crustenstein, which is a, a, a sort of a slime of biofilm, mainly made by blue green algae, which you could find on rocks in limestone lakes and karstic lakes. This one does have a common name. Uh, it's in Earth. So not, I think it's Cohen Beckham. I think it means little white thing. I'm not, going to do it. I'm not going to pronounce it properly. And the reason I'm doing this one is because I want to emphasise to you there are beetles that occur in the British Isles which aren't British. Uh, here we have this the species lives in Loch Carra on the limestone in the west of Ireland. It lives in several sites of uh, these vanishing lakes or turlochs uh, in the Barrow in, in the west of Ireland as well. Uh, for my sins, I misidentified it when a PhD student presented it to me. I misidentified it as Octavius Nanus. Uh, I, I, I then discovered that the original record of even of Octavius Nanus in Ireland was wrong. It was a, a leaking pen. Uh, that's another story. Uh, and uh, so we got rid of both of those records. It was very silly. Uh, and then uh, the Manfred Jakin Vienna Museum said, you, know, you think you should check that this is not Octavius Nilsson. I would say, don't be so stupid. Yeah, so that's a species confined to the north of Sweden. Anyway, I dissected it. This is, remember, this is a 1.6 millimetre long beetle, and that's its um, 0.8 millimetre long penis there on the right. We dissected it, and yes, indeed, it was Octavius nilsoni, which was originally found and described from a lake in the north of Sweden, suspiciously close to the home of our president of our club. That it, it, honestly, he has looked for it in the in many, many sites in Sweden without success since then. So I don't know if this is a chance phenomenon. Uh, so there it was in, in, in uh, Sweden, northern Sweden and in the Barren, not found at all in England or, or Scotland or Wales. Uh, and then, of course, we, the next records came along with it from the Talimento Valley, the other side of the Alps, where it's in a sort of oozy, um, sort of almost polyfiller-like or creamy um, mud from, uh, from the Dolomitic Alps. Dolomitic Alps of limestone, and they produce this oil. Well, it's really more toothpaste, and you've got to work in toothpaste to find it. And only as a result of a talk I gave last year in uh, Ireland, we discovered there was also a possibility of a record in Lake Garda as well, which gives somebody a chance of a very nice holiday. But it, you see, there's a bit of dirty great gap in between there where nothing happens. We have checks all of the limestone lakes we can think of, particularly in uh, southern Sweden for a start, where the obvious place to go. And we've been, it's been completely unable to find it. Uh, just for good measure, here is Nielsen. It is Octavius Nielsen, named after uh, named after Anders Nielsen. There he is. Um, he looks a bit distorted. I think he, I don't think he looks a bit distorted, doesn't he? I don't think he's that tall. But a Dutchman and the blue green alga, which is covering the the slime in this dried out turlock in the west of Ireland, is called Schizothrix fasciculata. There you are. That's what it does. So if that's a fair range of habitats for you already and sizes, I'm now going to go on to a, a different one altogether, which is quite topical, if you can believe in water beetles being ever topical. 
Uh, it's one of our bigger diving beetles, over 30 millimetres long. Uh, can live in ponds, in lakes and ditches. Predator is adults and larvae. Larvae feed mainly on immature insects. Uh, has no common name because really it's not really strictly speaking, I suppose, yet quite British. It's not not quite made it yet. Um, and now this is the sort of like you're going to have to watch carefully as I go through this slide. Okay, um, where do we start? Well, you can start in London, the area in Essex, where it was originally found in the 1830s in oyster baskets. Some of them presumably came from Essex or then transferred to London. Uh, so that those are the first records. One of the specimens that was there at that time turned out not to be, or was thought not to be Lateralis marginalis, but was actually another species, Tripunctatus. Now, if you know anything about uh, modern news, the uh, British Museum has uh, lost a few items in the, in the recent past, apparently, which went on eBay. Uh, Natural History Museum has lost this Tripunctatus specimen. So if you see it on eBay, really please let me know because we want to check that it really is Tripunctatus. But there's, so there's another one of these early records of this species in Britain. Uh, going another another area, that the, only as recently as it transpired, there was a very old un, unnoticed record by Frederick Holm from Marazion Marsh in, in Cornwall, which again is the, the, the lost in the in the mists of time, and uh, so nobody can check it out or anything like that. But it was only discovered last year. That this record exists but the most interesting one was here jim thomas in 2000 took one specimen in Leyton moss uh, in the lake district or just outside the lake district and uh he had it in his collection for several years before he finally asked me he said there's what's wrong with this statisticus marginalis um because it's, it's obviously sort of something is distorted and of course it isn't it isn't a statisticus at all it's different body shape i hope some of you can at least see that and uh, it was a Sibester marginalis that had been turned up there. It's a pretty battered specimen. And uh, hopefully, I think it's now in Carlisle Museum. That that was the first genuine record of an adult uh, post-millennium. And then uh, Kev Jones in APEM, one of the Colston Saltifer, found a larva in a bottle trap uh, in a place I can't name, which has got a nuclear power station in it. So it was there, there, there on the Suffolk coast uh, as part of a, a consultancy job and four marks to care for that, alerting us to this because immediately people were scared stiff that they're going to be besieged by water beetles trying to break into the power station to uh, catch some more. But they, I wish they would actually because we, we haven't, seen, haven't seen it since. That was last year. Nobody's found any more of the, these beetles since then. But if you look, if you look at the record abroad, this species is increasingly common across most of mainland Europe, uh, spreading into, into quite north northerly parts of Russia, for example, and, and also in, into the west, in the east rather, of uh, to Kazakhstan and places like that. Uh, yeah, so that, that's a couple of those records. But you see there's one record left, and that is Russell Coop, who was the great uh, expert on fossil water beetles, or well, fossil beetles, and fossil insects for that matter, uh, he he was he was he found it in an expo an exposed site on the a fossil site on the cliff face at Pakefield, twenty five kilometres northeast of where Kevin Jones got it in a bottle trap in two thousand twenty two. Those are all our records. It'd be so nice to start filling it in with. Uh, it, it's got to be in the south of England somewhere, doing quite nicely by now. If you're wondering about, wondering about what a what a bottle what a what a a wattle bottle trap? What a bottle trap is. And um, for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, the normal way of doing it, you simply take a one litre drinks bottle, you cut its neck off, you turn the neck inside out so it's inside, so you end up with a sort of minnow trap effect. You staple that or, or glue it together. You put some um, cat food in there, usually fish, fish based is better than chicken based, a piece of liver or something like that. And you put it under the water and you, you, you make sure you know exactly where it is. And you make damn sure that uh, later on, a day or two later, you would actually find that trap. You do not leave the traps in the water because they can be, be absolutely disastrous in terms of eliminating large animals, including, dare I say, it, newts, who also get into these traps. So you mustn't do that. Okay. But I'm sure that's where the, these, when, when people start to find these people in Britain, as they will, that's the, the, again, will be the way in which they're found by bottle trapping for other species altogether. Right. Now, what I'm trying to stick in for luck uh, is another big beetle. This is Tetiscus circumflexus, um, another uh, uh, the, another large beetle, up to 32 millimetres along this one. Lives in ponds and saline lagoons. 
And for years, including Balfour Brown's books, um, it was said that uh, this species was, con well, not exactly confined to, but bred in saline lagoons and presumably now and again specimens got out and went, went somewhere else. And that explains the odd distribution. Uh, in fact, I mean, yes, okay, it can cope with salt water, but it's far from being confined to salt water. Uh, it does have a common name, which I find extremely irritating, which is it's called the wasp. Uh, why on earth anybody would want to call one insect after another insect is quite beyond me. You can see it, it does actually got sort of wasp-like markings. And in a, in a sense, it's certainly got a sting because the postcoxal processes there, the, these processes that sort of bristle-like species, the things that stick out of the back there, which make it unpleasant for birds to swallow or fish to swallow, uh, these are extremely sharp in this particular species, unlike the common great diving beetle. Um, what else do I need to say? Well, the, the other way, the other reason for showing this at this stage is to emphasize the fact if you're going to take a photograph of a beetle larva and kill it and put it in a tube of alcohol uh, in the hopes that I can identify it without having to um, dissect it or anything, then for heaven's sake, make sure you take a photograph of the underside. The underside is much, it's got a lot more characters going for it than the upper side of most beetles. Right, this is distributions, and it shows you what I mean, I hope. In, up to 1979, the species was confined more or less to England, uh, one or two records in Wales, uh, and was mainly in the, the London marshes along the Thames and on the, on the south coast in Ceylon lagoons. And uh, But you can see there are inland records, made mainly from, from worked-out quarries and places like that where the, the uh, water quality is um, certainly, certainly base-rich at least. There's nothing else. Uh, and then 18, 1980 to 1999, I think by 1980, I was more or less giving up recording beetles, but we kept going uh, until the end, uh, I think. Uh, here you see that the distribution started to change a bit. Uh, so it's got as far as the southern end of the Lake District. It's got into Yorkshire. Uh, still not doing very well in Wales. Still the old one record in, in, in Ireland. And then if you look at the most recent distribution map, if anything, it's been a slight shift. It, it's now well established in the south of Scotland along the Solway coast to uh, Mull of Kintyre. Northernmost record, though, is actually in, in Holy Island, uh, beside Holy Island in Northumberland. Uh, one or two extra records in, in Ireland. And certainly nothing remotely resembling a brackish water species distribution now, very much um, occupying former... Um, worked out uh, basically uh, mi mining subsistence ponds, uh, old old leisure lakes and all that sort of thing. It can live in any any sort of reasonable lake that's got a bit of vegetation. But a long way to go yet in terms of its final distribution, I suspect. Uh, one, I made a terrible mistake with this, with this species um, in that it does have two forms of female, one with the grooves on the back and one without. And I for my sins, I've never recorded this properly. As far as we can see, the, both both forms occur throughout the distribution, but uh, it's one serious mistake I made at the beginning when we started recording these beetles. Can we uh, slowly backtracking to check the old material again? Changing to another big beetle. This is one that has always had a good common name, great silver water beetle, uh, Hydrophilus pisius. Uh, and it's in the Hydrophilids. Uh, it's up to anything up to nearly 50 million, 50 millimeters long. It's a big thing. As we said, some people, some person once was, uh, said it resembled a, a small individual pork pie. Uh, you can eat them. They are, they are quite, uh, got quite a nasty, crunchy exterior. Live in ditches and ponds, not so much in lakes or anything like that. They live, they live in, using dense vegetation as adults because they feed on plants. And the larvae uh, feed on snails. Uh, and... Uh, Absolutely disgusting things if you ever caught one. They, they can give you quite a nasty bite. They can also give you a very nasty smell, uh, and they do make a noise. There's its distribution, and it's it's a great. This has been a great result from COVID, in that an awful lot of moth collectors started to run light traps much more frequently during COVID because they were trapped at home, uh, and they also got fed up with looking at moths and eventually started looking at the other things that they were catching in their moth traps. Uh, which included Hydrophilus pisces because it flies at dusk and at dawn. And uh, so uh, we managed to fill in the distribution of it quite well in the last four years as a result of mainly of moth, moth collectors with their light traps. You can see it's confined to the um, Somerset levels and the, the, the adjacent parts of the Welsh uh, levels as well. 
uh, most, mostly across Norfolk. Originally, it was known from Cambridgeshire fens, where it's still quite rare. Again, it's a species that must be on the increase there now. Uh, and it's also around the Thames marshes or the London marshes and uh, my old home county of uh, Sussex as well. It's very common along the coast there. And only quite recently as it uh, turned up again in the Isle of Wight and in uh, Guern no, that's Guernsey, yes, Guernsey, and yes, Jersey, hang on, let's get this right, yes. It's only recently been rediscovered in the, in the Channel Islands. So, again, a story, in case you're wondering what the red ring is for, um, one of the specimens in our collection I'm most proud of, and I showed to people and they're horrified, is uh, the carcass, uh, headless carcass, le headless legless carcass covered in mud of the beetle that was found on this oil platform in 1993. Just to emphasise the fact that uh, this species can actually, as you, everybody knows, it can fly considerable distances. And uh, yeah, there was even a, a suggestion at one time that it regularly recruited new specimens from uh, abroad. Let's see if we could allow that to happen. Um, another beetle here. Another, another, di yeah, another. This is, this is a very boring di diving beetle, this one. Now, well, I should have said, by the way, when I went when I was looking at Violus, some of you might know if you, uh, as Normandia, it's changed its name because of DNA. And the same applies to this one. It, it used to be called Vantus, um, but the DNA analysis shows that it's now a quite separate uh, genus uh, called Nartus, which has a the closest relative is actually in North America. Uh, this is 11 meter, millimeter long, again, another thumbnail job. Lives in fens and bogs, uh, usually hiding in amongst uh, dense vegetation. Again, predator, I say no, no common name. Um, and here it is, and it's a very boring beetle. You can see there, so it's not a smooth beetle, but uh, black. Looks very like the commonest beetle in Britain, which is Agabus bypostulatus. Uh, it's different, it, it's, it's ostrich like. It, it will actually bury its head in amongst the debris and think that you can't see it. It's very, very good at hiding, in, in, uh, when it, even in a net on the tray. But again, even though it's been well, we know it for a long for a long time in Britain, um, it's still doing things. And so, uh, for example, it only got to Scotland in 2014, and I got it in a, in a, in a I found one specimen in a pond that I knew extremely well in in Kukubisha. Uh, it's also got into a similar pond in in Ayrshire quite recently, not caught by me, uh, even though I, I live there. So it doesn't it doesn't guarantee it has to be my record? It isn't. It's quite widespread across um, Ireland in the centre, uh, very well known in Anglesey, There's virtually every pond there, and in Somerset levels and in Norfolk and so on, and Yorkshire and, and the Weald. Um, but in fact, the in Tregavon Bog, it was only discovered there, in again, a well-known site, it was only discovered there in 2023, whereas it, you know, it obviously got from either from there or from there in, into uh, Tregavon Bog. And uh, as David Bilton noted when he found it, uh, it was been mating at the time with uh, Vantus exoetus, from which it had been separated by 50 million years and genetically, and yet they were still at it. Um, so that's a bit like um, us getting involved with, um, well, certainly something well beyond the Antitel man, anyway. Uh, probably, so, so I don't know, I don't think, I think we should leave this particular point immediately. Now, the real reason for showing this, going back, is that um, here's a species, if I can remember how to go backwards on this thing. Let's put you down there. Oh, that's the wrong one. Ah, no, that, not that one. Not that one. I knew that. I knew I shouldn't do this. Sorry about this. Um, get there in the end. Yeah, that one. I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm not used to this laptop. What I like about this map, it, it shows that this species probably arose... Got, Probably got into Scotland, not from England, but from either the Isle of Man, where it's common in the north, or um, from Ireland. Uh, so, that, so several routes of arrival into Britain. Uh, that's one of the, that's so that was that's the difference as far as I was concerned. That's the sort of thing that I like. Now, maybe you're not bothered about that sort of thing. I don't know. Maybe therefore we shouldn't work on water beetles. But so uh, it's, it's one of the things you can do. And I thought I'd better switch to actually get a common species for a change. This is Anacena lutescens. It's, uh, as you can see from that silvery bubble, bubble covering it, the entire outside, underside of the body, it's a hydrophilic beetle, a bit like I showed you on the first, the copy, the front cover of the second volume of the Atlas. The antennae, as you can see sticking up the front, aren't antennae, they're actually maxillary palps. 
Uh, they're short, they're short they're feelers. They're not, so the pouts are working as feelers, whereas the antennae are now, are now small, hairy clubs, water repellent hairy clubs, which are used to break through the surface. But the great trick of these small uh, hydrophilic beetles is that they can walk upside down just under the water's surface without the their bubble of air um, as, as being attached to the main bubble of air, which we call the uh, uh, atmosphere. Uh, so they can actually walk carrying their bubble with, with them on the on uh, above them in a sense underneath the water. A very strange trick when you think about it. Three millimeters long, lives in ditches and ponds. Adults feed on decayed plant tissue. They they like it, but there's a bit of rotting tissue. The larvae, if they rarely seen, uh, live in the extreme edge of ponds and are probably ambush predators, sort of waiting for something to pass by and then nabbing it. They're, they're, so they feed, and uh, again, no common name. Shame in this case. Best way to catch it, though, as I said, it says here, is to use a tea strainer rather than a pond net, because what you do, you kick the edge of the margin of the pond, and they, they then get disturbed, they pop up, they can't swim, and you can just scoop them up in your, your tea strainer. There, there's, a, there's a distribution of a common lowland beetle. They've got lots of maps like this, so they're very boring in a sense, but this one's a little bit more interesting than usual. Um, if you keep looking at it, you'll see there are gaps. Now, those, those aren't gaps by the, caused by the absence of water beetles, uh, because in some of these parts of the world, they're, they're quite good water beetle records. Uh, they're, they're, they're gaps caused by the beetle itself. And there's another thing going on here, which is when, when Arno van berger Hennegoen first realised that there were two species of Anacena rather than one, he noted the fact that one of them, this one we're talking about at the moment, Lutessens, Seemed to be all female. Uh, you couldn't find any males. So you had difficulty finding males. Anyway, uh, and then my friend Robert Angus um, looked at the uh, chromosomes of this species and found, yes, indeed, there's a something wrong with this particular chromosome pair here. There's a bit missing. It's got inverted. And this this species is in the north of its range, in, represented entirely by females. It's parthenogenetic, and there are there are no males. On top of that, occasionally you get what we call multi polyploids where the because they're not mating they can actually have uh, several sets of chromosomes in the same cell so here's a triploid from almothwaite for example so so they're, they're going they're going to go close down the possibility of ever becoming sexual again uh, so that's that's that one i'm just see what i'm doing this way here we go yeah uh so that map i can't show you the map side by side by this but if you i hope you remember it it was absent from the driest parts of england yes it was um, it, it was seen to be surprisingly thinning out in some parts of the south. Well, that's where it's competing with the other species of Anacena. There are two of the damn things, very similar, three million meters long, very subtle differences in the number of hairs on the on the underside of their back legs. Very difficult. You can't do it by penises in this case. Uh, this species is also very absent in most mountainous areas. I say if, if males are not known north of Westmoreland, or as you might call it, Cumbria, I don't know. Uh, so they're, they're found in the Lake District, just about where you cannot find them in Scotland. And we, of course, by definition, you think about it, we're not sure how far south the parthenogenetic race penetrates. But in a sense, we have three species around the Sina. One, one which is Limbata, I've not shown in that, was very boring, a southern species. Anacena lutessen is the sexual one, which gets up to the Scottish border, doesn't quite make it over the border. And then the other species, which, for all we know, could be all over the place. Right, I hope what that's done in those those nine species, we've still got a little bit of time left, is to raise a whole series of issues. The first issue we've raised is death. Death is very important to us uh, in the sense that if you, we we, we, we can't do everything by photographs. Uh, and even, even underside photographs won't always work. So we have to have, in many cases, actual animals with us to make sure we know what we're talking about. So we do need vouchers. We're never going to get away from vouchers. Uh, and sometimes uh, we have to dissect those vouchers. And sometimes we have a 1.6 millimeter long beetle with a 0.8 millimeter long piece in the penis. And if you're daft enough to put them both in the same tube and expect somebody to find them and, and keep them together later on, you're, you're an idiot. Because uh, the best way to do it is to um, put them on a card. So you glue the specimen, what's left of it, after you dissect it in one part of the card. And you put the penis onto another part of the same card. And that, that way, before you know it, hey, Presso, you've got yourself a dry collection of beetles. Just like an old schoolboy. I, I do mean schoolboy days. I don't mean school person days. 
when, when us as schoolboys used to do these things. So I'm afraid, you know, we, we, we still keep collections. They're very important to us uh, to validate what it is we've done. And the beauty of some of these collections nowadays, even if they're very old, for example, Charles Darwin, 1829, you can still get the DNA out of the thing. Uh, so that they, they still have useful history associated with them yet to come. Uh, we use nets. You know, we typically talk about a one millimeter mesh. Uh, not, in other words, one millimeter holes. Far, half of that is probably better, but you then get clogged up with mud. Um, we also, I mentioned again, trays. We need trays. They're, they're just as important as nets. You, you tip the contents of your net, net, net into the tray so you don't lose anything. And you, you have plenty of chances to actually find things that are hiding in amongst the debris. Uh, you could use kitchen sieves, if you like, as most of the Dutch still seem to do. You could use tea strainers as well. But I still think a tray is a really good thing to have. Um, you can do, you can go in for activity trapping, which is basically putting the uh, uh, drinks bottles in, in with, with a bit of uh, cat food, as long as you do it properly. Um, light trapping as, it, as, it's, as, it's, as a role to play. But in fact, the number of species that are caught by light traps is very, very limited, less than a 10 um, on a routine basis. And that's because an awful lot of water beetles fly during the day. Uh, that it's only that, so all you're doing is catching the ones that are sub-crepuscular, the ones that go out at dawn and dusk. Um, I don't know if you watch the programme on television, The Detectorists, but they're, they're, of course they, they were looked down upon by the professional uh, 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 people, uh, archaeologists, and I suspect we, if if we started as amateurs to start looking for sub fossils in deposits, we'd be looked down upon by professional entomologists as well. I've done it a few times; it's quite exciting, but you really need to do it under very controlled conditions where you know exactly what the what where the the, the debris came from. We've got a preferably if you've got somewhere that's already been um, carbon dated. That would be a great help to start with. But even then, I suspect some people will be quite sniffy about what we do. But then, of course, if you know, again, what goes on nowadays, detectorists have become incredibly valuable people in, in archaeology. So hopefully we could become valuable as amateur fossil, sub-fossil hunters. You never know. The other thing I've not mentioned so far is, uh, is eDNA. That's environmental DNA. There's a possibility, uh, going back now, nearly, nearly, I think, 18 years, where you can actually... Take a water sample, filter off some mud and muck from the side of a pond, extract from it the DNA, fit it up to whatever you can find in terms of um, what we call barcodes of um, beetle DNA, and give yourself a list of beetles without actually ever seeing a beetle. You could do it. It has been done once or twice. I have to tell you that in the last year, we've done this on a fairly uh, a series of sites in England and Scotland, and uh, really it's been very disappointing so far. Still plenty of um, time for development of that side of the business. Uh, certainly, beetles do produce DNA. At one time, it was thought that they, they just didn't leak enough DNA, you know, like fish and amphibia. Uh, but in fact, you can, you can do it, but it's uh, very, very hit and miss. So I don't think that's going to become an amateur hobby for a while. It costs about 120 quid or so anyway. I thought at the end, getting very near to the end there, in case you're worried, uh, we look at all the con contrasts and gradients that we have before us, comparing these with what you might get in other groups of animals that you might care to work on. Uh, you, may, you may be able to think of differences if you know. But anyway, look, as far as I'm concerned, we run from the tops of the mountains uh, down to the salt marshes and sometimes even to, even to rock pools in, in the edge of the sea. We, we have beetles that are found in all of these habitats. We have beetles that are subterranean, uh, but also can we can find beetles that are in the in estuarine rivers. We have beetles that are confined to permanent water in lakes and ponds, and we have species that don't can't do that. Uh, they are sporadic, or they at least only occur in ponds that regularly dry out uh, because they can't stand predation from fish, which get wiped out by uh, drying out. Of course, uh, yeah. we have uh, beetles that are lived in live in brand new sites. Uh, and some which are intensely relict, relict, relict being the last species to uh, hang on to a site long after it's passed its sell-by date. Uh, so we talk about the first to arrive and the last to go as being beetles. Uh, we have beetles that live in any incredible acidity, down to pH 3, uh, and in alkaline sites as well, and of course, and also into, into uh, deeply extreme hypersaline water in in rock pools. 
Um, we're not a bit bit weak on um, like, uh, chalk rivers. Not not many species there, apart from ones who sub semi subterranean species. We have species that live in shaded water, regardless of what the shading is. Uh, and we do have sites that we have beetles that are uh, found in um, exposed sites where you might have a bit of wave a wave wash shore will look very unpromising, but in fact we'll have beetles clinging onto it desperately. Uh, we some beetles live in it only in pristine water. Some actually like a little bit, or sometimes a lot, of pollution. Therefore, Brown always used to quote the the story of the great diving beetles that were found underneath gas holders in the days where, and you can imagine how un, un, unpleasant that would have been. Not not just for the gas that was in the holders, but also for the oiliness of the of the water underneath them. Uh, we've got so species associated with eutrophic waters. We have species associated with oligotrophic waters, like that uh, water beetle in, uh, in the Ophelius nilsoni in the, in the Turlocks in Ireland. And I think the most important contrast and gradients are between amateurs and academics and between academics and consultants who are making money out of it rather than doing it for science. And it's a sort of it's a it's a wonderful triangle, and I hope that I actually sit within the middle of all three of these. I can claim to be all three of them, and I, it's a, it's a great joy of, of, of our part of our work. And I'm going to finish briefly with this because it means nothing. It's got absolutely nothing to do with this talk at all. Um, this is the Clyde estuary. You're looking out to sea there. Uh, the mouth. Of, this is the sea. Uh, this is a salt marsh, which uh, two or three late, hours later will be inundated with the sea. Uh, we're moving our stat above the stat wife, my wife's stat head standing there, and we'll do that every twice a day. Uh, there's a tray, right? Very important, still part of the, part of the equipment. If I was going to copyright anything, it would be that tray. Uh, and then in that marsh, there will be salt marsh species that live quite happily in, in highly brackish water and don't mind being dunked in the sea twice a day. But where my wife is, there was a cloud. There was a little bubble coming up when we went there, and it, uh, it, it, bubbles popping up to the surface. And we looked in, and lo and behold, there was some fresh water coming up in the sea, and within it, there were uh, quite a number of these beetles, Hydrocus obsoletus, living under the sea. I stopped. What do you want to do now, Kieran?